but early aircraft engines are notoriously unreliable. If two engines fail on one side of the plane, the remaining engines could force the aircraft to spin out of control. What Sikorsky realized was that the further out on the wings he put the engines, the worse the turning force was if two of the engines failed. So instead, he put the engines as close as possible to the fuselage. Now, if two of the engines fail, the turning force in the remaining engines is something that the pilot can control and the aircraft can keep on flying. But Sikorsky isn't certain this will stop the plane spinning out of control. So he makes one final alteration. He fits the completed Muramets with a huge rudder and adds two extra blades. The pilot uses foot pedals to change the angle of the blades. This changes the direction of the plane. Now, if two engines fail, the pilot can counteract the uneven thrust and steer the aircraft back on track. On March the 10th, 1915, Russian commanders load a Muromets with 45 bombs. In a daring raid, the pilot drops them all onto a German railway station. The target is destroyed. The age of the bomber begins. The Antonov is 80 times heavier than Sikorsky's Muromets. Russian engineer Oleg Antonov designs the plane in 1976 to carry tanks and military supplies for the Soviet Air Force. Deliberately planned to dwarf anything in the West, for the Soviets, the Antonov's sheer size is a symbol of their supposed superiority. Getting this giant off the ground when fully loaded takes a huge amount of power. There's only one engine up to the job. An engine that's capable of launching a fully armed fighter in just 300 meters. The jet. This Sunday on Great Migrations, they are driven by an insatiable appetite to survive. Elephant families endure heat and loss as they make their way toward rain-soaked lands. Swarms of jellyfish move eastward as they follow their food source, the sun. An arduous journey that is truly feast or famine. Great Migrations, Sunday at 10 p.m. on the National Geographic Channel. Presented by Panasonic Piera 3D TV in association with UPS and AsianPaints.com. It's time for an optimized email environment. Augmented reality and navigation services with a large display. A full web browsing experience. E reading solutions wherever and whenever you go. And a complete communication solution. Perfect in itself. More possibilities on the go. Samsung Galaxy Tab. Do you like bourbon biscuits? You hide and seek bourbon. Try it. What time is it? Milk and the world will change. Let her like fish cut the healthy home paints. Let her like Kuch change curry. Jello paint curry. When it's planes in the sky for a chain of supply, that's logistics. When 
the parts for the line come precisely on time. That's logistics. A continuous link that is always in sync. That's logistics. She's still not back. Hmm. Where could she be? It had to happen someday. Hmm. My baby. I hope she's okay. Go sleep. Oh, she's back. Hmm. Baby. My uh, baby. Uh, Mama. Huh? We know you love your car. At Club HP, we love your car the way you do. अच्छा लगता है. Experience Disney Tron Legacy. In high definition on the new Nokia N8 with high definition capture and edit capabilities which also comes with a 12 megapixel camera. So embark on an adventure to remember with the new Nokia N8. It's amazing technology. What will you do with it? Disney Tron Legacy in theaters December 17th. <laughs> The principle of the jet engine is simple. So simple, chemist Andrew Shidlow has made one from an office water cooler. This is a jet engine. It's a model of the real thing. A jet engine works on the principle that a fuel burns inside a combustion chamber, and there is only one exit. When the fuel burns, a huge amount of heat energy is generated. This heat energy causes enormous expansion, and the gases come shooting out through the exit which we have here. We'll now clip it on to our special apparatus here. Just like a real jet engine, this model contains a liquid fuel that expands explosively when it burns. Then we shall apply a light to it. The principle of the jet engine is that every action there is an equal and opposite reaction as the exhaust gases come out so the engine moves in the opposite direction. So, we're lighting the Oh. To produce a lot of power. Jet engines burn a lot of fuel. The Antonov needs to fly long distances but without refueling. So its engines can't simply be powerful, they must be efficient as well. This is not a conventional jet engine. It has a large fan at the front of the engine, a much smaller fan at the rear. And that's why it's called a turbofan engine. At the heart of each turbofan sits a normal jet engine which generates thrust. But the hot air that shoots out of the back of the jet also turns a fan. This fan drives a shaft that turns a larger fan in front of the engine. The second fan acts like a plane's propeller. sucking air through as it turns generating extra thrust the turbofan is actually a propeller and a jet engine rolled into one the combination means the turbofan is more fuel efficient than a conventional jet while still producing an incredible amount of power On takeoff the Antonov generates more thrust than 10 jet fighters. Okay. 
Even with a train on board, the Antonov's turbofan engines are so efficient they can power the plane from Germany to Delhi without refueling. Back in 1914, Sikorsky's Muromets used extra thrust to lift a payload of bombs. But to carry huge quantities of mail and parcels, designers would need to equip the 21-ton Junkers G-38 with a revolutionary pair of wings. In the 1920s, Europe begins transporting post by air. Airmail is born. German aircraft designer Hugo Junkers decides to build a huge new plane to cope with the ever-increasing volume of mail between Berlin and London. But building an aircraft of this size is a huge challenge. Early aircraft like the Muromets are biplanes. They have two wings connected together to make one strong structure. That's because at the time, engineers can't build a single wing strong enough to support an entire aircraft. The science of wing design at this stage was really very crude. You can see these wooden struts here are essentially giving the whole structure just some kind of rigidity and holding the two wings together. When you look at the cables, it's much more complex. This uh, uh, top wing here is now generating a tremendous amount of lift, literally in order to get the aircraft off the ground. So these cables here go completely uh, rigid in flight. But the structures that make a biplane's wings strong cause problems for the plane once it's in the air. The struts and wires connecting a biplane's wings have a surprisingly large surface area. This creates a large amount of drag as the aircraft moves through the air. To carry heavy cargo, a plane needs bigger wings. These require even more struts and wires, which generate more drag. The extra drag means big biplanes can't lift heavy cargo. But Hugo Junkers has a hunch that a single thick wing will generate more lift and less drag than a pair of biplane wings. he sets out to prove his theory. By now, Junkers had access to a wind tunnel, and he was able to show that a single, much thicker wing was still better than having two smaller wings. Effectively, what Junkers was able to do was to merge these two wings together into one and put all the necessary supporting structure inside it. Junkers covers his one thick wing with an aluminium skin. Despite being over two meters thick, the wing's streamlined shape cuts through the air, producing very little drag, but plenty of lift. This enables the aircraft to carry six tons of mail. Junkers plane, named the G-38, lifts off for the first time in 1929. The wings are so thick, there's actually room inside for passenger seating with forward-facing windows. Junkers was a remarkably visionary man, and many of his ideas were way ahead of his time. His concept of using the space inside a thick wing to carry passengers or cargo is exactly the idea that's being explored by the most advanced designers of today. <laughs> Antonov 124 is en route to Delhi with the metro train safely secured in its cargo hold. With a wingspan of over 70 meters, 
eight double-decker buses could park end-to-end -end across the Antonov's wings with room to spare. Making such big wings strong enough to support the fully loaded Antonov is a huge engineering challenge. And that's because they're made of aluminium. When metal workers forge a bar of aluminium, they must make sure it cools evenly. Otherwise, internal stresses make the metal weak. But it's difficult to maintain even cooling along a lengthy bar. So before the Antonov, metal manufacturers only produce short aluminium girders. These have to be bolted together to give wing strength. But this means lots of joints, and where there's a joint, there's a weakness. The Antonov's wings can't be made from short sections. So Soviet engineers build an aluminium plant where for the first time the cooling process is controlled by computer. The plant can forge huge 8 meter long aluminium girders and cool them evenly, keeping them strong. Engineers now only need four long girders to stretch the entire length of the Antonov's wings. With fewer joints, the wings are now strong enough to lift the heaviest loads. Back in 1929, Hugo Junkers proved that single-winged aircraft could lift enormous loads. But soon, new challenges emerged. To convince passengers to cross the Atlantic in the 38-ton Boeing Clipper, engineers would have to make their aircraft much safer. In 1930s America, airlines are becoming big business. Commercial planes flying a mixture of passengers and mail are turning a tidy profit. But commercial aircraft have yet to conquer the most important route of all, the flight across the Atlantic linking America and Europe. Pan American Airlines are determined to operate the first transatlantic flights. But the challenge isn't just about building a plane that can fly the distance. The transatlantic operation was an enormously prestigious exercise for Pan Am. Their problem was that aviation at that time was very much less safe than it is now. In particular, the reliability of engines was, was really very poor by today's standards. So if they were ever going to make this route work, they needed to persuade people not only that it would be a, a very enjoyable experience, but that in the reasonably likely event that something did go wrong, they would still be safe. In 1936, Pan Am writes to all the major aircraft manufacturers in America, issuing them a challenge. They offer a cash reward for an aircraft design that meets a stringent set of specifications. The plane should be able to carry four and a half tons of cargo and 70 passengers. It must fly at 240 kilometers an hour against a 50 kilometer an hour headwind. It must have the range to make the 3,100 kilometer Atlantic crossing without stopping. And in case the passengers are afraid of flying over nothing but sea, it must be the safest aircraft in the sky. The brief is so ambitious that several companies simply don't submit designs. But engineers at the Boeing Airplane Company take an unconventional approach to the design of Pan Am's aircraft. They think of it as a boat. They make the cabins the last word in luxury, giving them air conditioning and a separate bar. Below decks, designers fit 11 watertight compartments, sandwiched between two hulls. 
Even if the outer hull springs a leak, the water won't penetrate the inner hull and sink the boat. They equip their craft with an anchor and life rafts. But they also fit it with wings. This boat will be in the air as on the water. These are the original drawings that uh, Boeing sent to Pan Am uh, in response to their request. And although they're very basic, I think something about the impressive lines of this aircraft uh, does come over straight away, and you can see how it would have captured Pan Am's imagination. As it happens, it's a matter of record that they took just three days to select Boeing for the contract once they saw these drawings. With the Boeing Clipper, Pan Am launched the first commercial passenger and cargo service across the Atlantic. But in 1947, the Clipper's claim as the safest plane in the skies is truly tested. Halfway across the Atlantic, a Clipper discovers that it doesn't have enough fuel to make it to dry land. The sudden, horrifying realization that this is now going to happen to you when just a, a second ago you'd been having a drink or having a meal or something must have been truly terrifying. And of course, as they then approach the water and looking out of the window at it, and realizing just how bad the conditions were out there, you can only imagine the kind of terror that they must have experienced. The Clipper survives a heavy crash landing, but must now cope with gale force winds and 10 meter high waves. The hull is severely damaged. A passenger captures the entire episode on camera. You can see this really is a pretty uh, horrific experience they're going through. They're just dressed in whatever coats they had in the, in the airplane with them. They're, they're still at risk of uh, falling into the sea. It's a, a clearly an extremely dangerous situation. The Clipper stays afloat for the next 24 hours. The US Coast Guard rescue all on board. It's, it's really a great tribute to Boeing's design that this aircraft, which was intended to, to float on the ocean if need be, did in fact uh, stay afloat all the way through the night and into the next day, and as a result, everybody was saved. it's time for an optimized email environment. Augmented reality and navigation services with a large display a full web browsing experience, e-reading solutions wherever and whenever you go, and a complete communication solution, perfect in itself. More possibilities on the go. Samsung Galaxy Tab. Caress the senses. Explore your shores. Sip the high life. Grip the moment. The sound of a racing pulse. The wisp of glass. Look up. Look beyond. See in a new light. The all new Skoda Fabia. Now, that's fab.
The streets were packed with horses, producing millions of pounds of emissions every day. But then, our company founders had an idea that changed the way we move forever. Today's problem? Cars producing too much CO2. So it's time for a new great idea. Blue Efficiency is our way to emission-free mobility. Now available in over 85 Mercedes-Benz models. Let like pesh karte hain. Healthy home pants. Narrow line. Kuch change kare. Chalo paint kare. Chura liya. Chura liya hai tumne jo dil ko. Chura liya. Come alive. Back in 1939, the Boeing Clipper was able to safely cross even the widest oceans. But the Clipper could only take off and land on water. Engineers building the hulking 43-ton Messerschmitt Gigant would have to find a way for it to touch down on land. In 1941, World War II is raging. Germany is fighting on two fronts, the deserts of Africa and the cold steppes of Russia. They desperately need a big cargo plane that can deliver heavy equipment to their frontline troops. The biggest plane in the German Air Force is the ME321, a huge cargo-carrying glider. On takeoff, the 321 rests on a detachable trolley. Three fighter aircraft then tow it down the runway. But even these don't have the power to get it off the ground. So engineers fit detachable rockets to provide extra thrust. The aircraft is so heavy that instead of wheels, it lands using two pairs of skids to spread the load over a large area. But the glider has a fatal flaw. Once on the ground, without its trolley and a tow from another plane, the 321 can't move. It's stranded. Each ME321 was expected to make a single one-way trip in an invasion. And in fact, the pilots were equipped with explosives to destroy the aircraft as soon as it landed. As a glider, what it could never do was make repeated cargo-carrying flights. To convert this glider into a useful cargo plane, German engineers don't just have to fit it with engines. They must also replace the skids with permanent wheels. But a plane this heavy needs some serious suspension. Normal springs absorb the energy of an impact, then release the energy again by springing back. The last thing an aircraft wants to do is to hit the ground, then bounce back into the air like a pogo stick. German designers find the solution from an unexpected source, the buffers on the front of trains. When a train hits the buffers, it doesn't bounce back. It's brought to a gradual stop. The energy of the impact is absorbed by a special device called a friction spring. It's made from a series of metal rings with angled edges. On impact, these rings grind over one another, generating friction. This turns the energy of a sudden impact into heat, which harmlessly dissipates into the air. It 
It's the perfect spring to soften the landing of a 40-ton cargo plane without bouncing it back into the air. The plane, fitted with engines as well as its new landing gear, first flies in 1941. The warehouse-like interior can hold a tank or truck. It can carry 150 fully equipped troops. German troops simply call it Gigant, the German word for giant. It's hard not to be impressed by the ingenuity of the German designers. They produced an aircraft which would turn out to be the biggest land-based aircraft of the entire war. The Antonov 124 is on its final approach to Delhi Airport. Metro train on board, it can't afford a rough landing. Such a gentle touchdown is made possible by some very special landing gear. It's made up of 24 wheels that sit on massive shock-absorbing pistons called struts. The amount of pressure on these struts is enormous. The aircraft can land with a weight of up to 330 tonnes, and that 330 tonnes is initially borne by the 10 struts fitted to the main landing gear. That equates to around 33 average-sized cars being placed on one of these struts alone. A single piston connects each pair of wheels to the bottom of the plane. Inside each piston is a layer of air, a layer of oil, and a metal barrier with a small hole in it. As the plane lands, the piston forces the oil through the hole. This compresses the air, which absorbs the impact of the landing like a spring. Once the plane has landed, the compressed air expands, forcing the piston back up. This forces the oil back through the hole, which slows the piston's movement, preventing it from rebounding quickly. This keeps the Antonov's cargo from bouncing around, even in a heavy landing. Back in 1941, Special springs allowed super-heavy aircraft like the Messerschmitt Gigant to land safely. But engineers designing the 349-ton C-5 Galaxy would face a more unusual challenge. They must find a way to unload their cargo whilst airborne. In the early 1960s, the Cold War is in danger of turning hot. The US Air Force needs a plane that can carry vast quantities of military equipment to war zones far from home. But as well as lifting heavy cargo, this plane must be able to unload in even the most hostile territory. And that means dropping cargo by air. But opening a large cargo door mid-flight is inherently dangerous. Structural engineer Ed McCann explains why. In front of me here I have a cardboard tube with sealed ends and I, you need to imagine this as a, a plane in flight subject to buffeting wind loads and big vertical forces where the wings attach to the plane and where the tail assembly attaches to the plane. And if I put some blocks on here... Ed loads the tube with bricks to simulate the stress an aircraft fuselage might experience during flight. 
Now this, this, what I'm doing here is generating the sort of forces that you get on the rear of the plane due to the tail assembly. And on a normal plane, of course, it's all sealed up at the back. There's no hole. And we can see there that that's pretty OK. There's a small deflection in the tube there, but that's basically sound. A sealed cylinder is capable of taking very large loads. But if the cylinder isn't sealed, the situation is very different. Now, if I take the end piece off, let's watch what happens. And we can immediately see that it doesn't work very well. And it's, it's amazing, actually, the effect that this has. What this means for your plane in flight, of course, is that opening the back door is a very, very dangerous thing to do. To solve this problem, engineers strengthen the body of the aircraft by adding a second sealed fuselage on top of the first. This creates a rigid backbone for the entire plane. Doors in the lower fuselage can now open safely, even in mid-flight. On the 7th of June 1989, the plane, christened the Galaxy C-5, sets off from Fort Bragg in North Carolina to test its airdrop capability to the limit. When its rear cargo doors open, four Sheridan tanks and 73 combat-ready troops parachute safely to the ground. It's the heaviest single airdrop ever recorded. The Galaxy has been a, a huge success story. Not only was it an immensely capable aeroplane in terms of its uh, enormous payload and its uh, very long range, it's never been replaced in service. And in fact, a program is underway now to modernize all its systems so that it will go on serving for many years into the future. <laughs> In Delhi, engineers are about to unload the Antonov 124. Like the Galaxy, the Antonov can airdrop cargo from its enormous rear doors. But the owners of this brand new metro train won't be very happy if it's dropped from a thousand meters up. Even on the ground, unloading a long item like a train from such a big plane isn't easy. When the aircraft was designed by the Soviet Union to transport very heavy rolling stock, vehicles like tanks, very heavy armoured personnel carriers and so on, you would not have easily been able to drive one of these up onto the ramp with a sail height of approximately 2.2 metres, which is what you have now. The angle that you would have to take this vehicle up would have been considerable. And of course you then have a risk of grounding of the vehicle as it goes over the apex Antonov's designers had to find a way to lower the floor of the cargo hold to allow long vehicles easy access. So incredibly, they engineer a way for the Antonov to kneel. First of all, two extendable legs, nicknamed elephant feet, descend from the nose. Then the front landing gear folds forwards. In this kneeling position, the cargo floor is low enough for long vehicles to unload down a ramp. Unloading the metro train in Delhi would be almost impossible without the Antonov's ability to kneel. As it is, unloading is still a delicate procedure. Precision is everything. One mistake could spell disaster. Mechanics slowly lower the train down the ramp along specially built rail tracks. Just two winches stop the train from running away.
The entire process takes seven long hours. The biggest relief for us is always that point where the train, the, whatever cargo it is we've carried, is being lifted off from our ramp by the crane. And we're then able to dismantle our equipment and start it all over again for somebody else. A train within a plane, from Germany to Delhi in just 10 hours. Yet another extraordinary feat by the Antonov 124. This Sunday on Great Migrations, they are driven by an insatiable appetite to survive. Elephant families endure heat and loss as they make their way toward rain-soaked lands. Swarms of jellyfish move eastward as they follow their food source, the sun. An arduous journey that is truly feast or famine. Great Migrations, Sunday at 10 p.m. on the National Geographic Channel. Brought to you by Synthol, long-lasting freshness for 24-hour confidence. Multiplex partner PVR Cinemas and print partner The Week. I carry optimized email, so I always keep in touch. I carry augmented reality and advanced navigation to discover more. I carry a full web experience for fun. I carry ebooks to read. I carry communication solutions to take care of business anytime. I carry my world everywhere I go with the new Samsung Galaxy Tab. technology another way Intel will change the way we live we are Intel sponsors of tomorrow over 8 million children in the world die before the age of five of these 2 million children die in India every day every minute these children die from diseases that are easily preventable a glass of clean drinking water can help save Girish's life. A nutritious meal for Balam will help her baby live longer. At Save the Children, we know what it takes to save a life. Only 300 rupees a month can save the lives of many children. All you have to do is call on 022-4272-7272 and they will live. It's time we cared. Please. Call now, 022-4272-7272. This could be Girish's last chance to survive. Narrow like pesh karte hain. Impressions Eco Clean, jo hai bilkul pyo. Na smell, na dhabbe, aur na hi harmful fumes. She's still not back. Hmm. Where could she be? It had to happen someday. Hmm. My baby. I hope she's okay. Go sleep. Oh, she's back. Mm. Baby. My baby. Uh -huh. <laughs> Mama. We know you love your car. At Club HP, we love your car the way you do. The black browed albatross log enough miles to circle the globe 140 times over. Their great migration depends on great logistics. Despite months at sea, they can locate their mate among thousands. And a new generation takes flight to travel the globe. In their world, just like ours, global operations depend on logistics. UPS is a proud sponsor of Great Migrations on the National Geographic Channel. HCL's handheld terminals. No place is too remote for banking solutions. Technology that touches lives. I'm Manish Malhotra. Just like me, you will also have a problem. 
नए कपड़े ज्यादा दिन नए जैसे नहीं चमकते पर एरियल लैब्स में मैंने देखा नए एरियल ऑक्सी ब्लू की टेक्नोलॉजी और अमेजिंग न्यू फॉर्मूला जिससे स्टेन गायब और कपड़ों में नई जैसी चमक कमाल की टेक्नोलॉजी इज इन नया एरियल ऑक्सी ब्लू चमक रखे नई जैसी Back in 1968, the galaxy could airdrop massive loads without having to land. But some cargo is too big, even for the galaxy. To carry the huge Russian space shuttle, designers would have to modify the 392-ton Antonov 124 and make it even bigger. At the height of the space race, the Soviet government decided to develop their own version of the space shuttle, called the Buran. The only high-tech factories able to manufacture the Buran are in Moscow. But the launch site is the Baikonur Space Center in a remote desert area of Kazakhstan. So engineers must find a way of transporting the space shuttle 2,000 kilometers. It's not really possible to move that type of aircraft by land, and the reason is that it is absolutely enormous. You couldn't get it under bridges. You couldn't get it down the uh, the smaller roads. You also have to do it very slowly, and it would take an enormously long time. There's only one option: transport the shuttle by air. But even with the biggest cargo plane in the world. It's not going to be easy. The space shuttle won't fit inside the Antonov 124. Engineers could enlarge the aircraft's fuselage, but it would have to be 20 meters wide and 17 meters high. With such a big fuselage, the plane would be too heavy to take off. They could tow the shuttle like a glider, but it's not designed to be towed. So instead, they decide to carry the Buran on top of the Antonov. But even the biggest cargo plane in the world. Isn't big enough to carry a space shuttle on its back. So Soviet authorities ask Antonov to build a one-off, specially extended version of the 124. Effectively, what the Russian government were asking Antonov to do was to build an aircraft that would be even bigger than the already enormous Antonov 124. And from the designer's point of view, their task then became to build simply the biggest aircraft in the world. Antonov's engineers extend the aircraft's fuselage by seven meters. They also bolt two new sections onto the base of the wings. This makes space for two more engines. Finally. Designers add eight more wheels to carry the extra weight. The biggest cargo plane in the world is now even bigger. But without one final alteration to the aircraft's rudder, it won't be able to carry the Buran space shuttle. Tristan Smith is an aeronautics expert at University College London. So at the back of the plane we have a rudder, and using this, the pilot can tilt it to the left, which causes the aircraft to steer to the left, or he can tilt it to the right and cause the aircraft to steer to the right. Now, seeing as we're in a wind tunnel, we can see how this works in practice. When the rudder turns, it catches the air rushing past the plane, creating drag. This pivots the aircraft left and right. It's essential for keeping control of a plane in flight. But when carrying a large object on top of the aircraft, the situation is very different. 
So this time, let's see what happens. The rudder turns, but it has very little effect. So clearly there's a problem. This load that we're carrying on top of the fuselage is creating a blockage, and off the back of it we're getting lots of turbulent air which is destroying the rudder's effectiveness. Putting a space shuttle on top of the Antonov causes a lot of turbulence at the rear of the aircraft. Air buffets the rudder from different directions, making it impossible to steer. So Antonov's designers split the rudder in two. Each rudder now sits in clear air, either side of the space shuttle. With the airflow unobstructed, the rudders can steer the aircraft more effectively, keeping the biggest plane in the world flying in a straight line. On the 3rd of May 1989, Russian engineers mount the Buran on top of Antonov's new plane. The biggest plane the world has ever seen roars into the skies, carrying 60 tons of space shuttle on its back. In flight, it is the most extraordinary sight, with its six engines, uh, its huge tail structure, but an incredible grace for such a large aircraft. It really is a wonderful thing to, to see in the skies. But at the moment, Antonov's one-off superplane is grounded for a major refit. So for the time being, the Antonov 124 truly is the king of cargo planes. Until someone builds an even bigger one.